the success of natural theology doesn't say much about Christianity in particular. So now we're going to talk about arguments that get you from a sort of generic deistic God to Christianity in particular. And surprise, surprise, everything runs through Jesus uh, from beginning to end. So that is where we are going to start. There we go. So the first question is, did Jesus of Nazareth exist? So that's where we'll start. And then ultimately we'll have to get into more complicated things. So uh, this week we're just talking primarily about the bare existence of Jesus, the sort of historical backdrop. And the next week we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the resurrection, which is more appropriate um, or more relevant uh, for that question. But we've got to start somewhere, so this is where we'll start. So did Jesus exist? Um, a couple of resources here. So Studying the Historical Jesus by Daryl Bach is pretty good. This is a very, like, super accessible introduction. It just goes over the sources. It goes over the methods. That's all you need. Um, the second book, which I really enjoy, is called Did Jesus Exist by Bart Ehrman. Uh, Ehrman is a, uh, he's, a, he's an agnostic uh, with atheist leanings, but he's also a professor of New Testament at Duke. And so he got really frustrated with a lot of atheists that were saying Jesus didn't exist and wrote a book saying, yeah, Jesus did exist. Um, it's a pretty, it, it's a popular level book. It's, uh, I, I kind of enjoy it. It's a little sassy too. So there's that, if you like that. Um, and then the last book um, that we'll be referencing a lot is The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach by Michael Lacona. This is probably like the book on the historicity of the resurrection. Um, certainly the best one written in the past probably 30 years. Okay, so another good book that, that I uh, enjoy is called The Historical Jesus, uh, Five Views, which is exactly what it says on the tin. You have five authors and they all uh, articulate different views of Jesus. Now, these are two particular quotes that I, I, I think really encapsulate this question of did Jesus exist? Um, so Robert Price is the first guy on the, on the list. I don't know if, you can, if I'm blocking that or not. And he takes the position Jesus didn't exist, that he was a mythical character. Uh, the other four um, contributors say no, not, not even close to, to a mythical character, definitely a guy in history. Um, and so Timothy Johnson here, or sorry, Luke, uh, Luke Timothy Johnson, his assessment of the mythicist view is, Robert Price gets Jesus to the vanishing point of history by the simple expedient of denying all the evidence that makes him visible. His writing lacks nothing in clarity or color, but it does lack the capacity to convince any but those who despair of history altogether. Uh, and James Dunn uh, was a little more aggressive in his assessment. Where I begin to become irritated with Price's thesis, as with those of his predecessors, is the fact that he ignores what everyone else in the business regards as primary data and his readiness to offer less plausible hypotheses to explain other data that inconveniences his thesis. In short, if Price's essay is a true expression of the state of health of the Jesus myth thesis, I can't see much life in it. His essay would better be retitled Jesus Mythicism, a Thesis at the Vanishing Point. So for at least these two guys, and they're not conservative evangelicals by far, um, for these two guys, and I can also add Bart Ehrman onto that, their view of did Jesus exist is like it's a fringe, crank, crazy view. Um, it's probably equivalent to uh, young earth creationism, frankly. Like once you get out of the sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say popular level because technically this is popular level, but once you get outside of like the church or out of your dorm or something like that and you start talking with academics, it's not a question. It's not a question that Jesus existed any more than it's a question of that the earth is, you know, billions of years old. But that by itself, that's not an argument. That's just kind of a, you know, that's the state of scholarship. So what I kind of want to do today is sort of very briefly and sort of casually actually kind of review some of the main sources uh, that are in this discussion um, and why most historians just don't really consider this to be an open question. So the first one, uh, let's see here. Is this going to work? Okay. So here's the, here's the thesis right here. Did Jesus exist? Yes. And the reason he, that he's known to exist is because he's abundantly attested in early sources. Now, it's typical at this time for you know, people in apologetics or Christians that are in a heated debate to just start listing a bunch of sources and say, look, the, the word Jesus shows up here. But um, I want to take a little bit of time to critically evaluate some of these sources and talk about what they're actually saying and what they're useful for. So there are essentially one of three questions that are relevant. The first one is, who was Jesus? This is like, what did he teach? What did he do? 
what was his self-perception like what was he about as a person again this is like a doctoral thesis answering that question the second one is the fate of jesus what actually happened to him you know um, the traditional answer is he was crucified but did something else happen to him after that um, what happened to his body after that like ultimately what was his end and then the third one is what was early christianity so this would be am i blocking stuff is my fat head in the way no oh okay um, and it's essentially like, what did his earliest disciples believe? What did they think? What did they do? What did they write? So with that in mind, um, whenever we talk about these sources, we have to evaluate, are they relevant for one of these uh, categories? So here, here will be the roadmap. First, we're going to talk about some non-Christian sources, because this will take like two minutes. Then we're going to talk about the extant Christian sources. That's essentially just what we have on hand. And then we're going to talk about um, antedated Christian sources, which is, uh, you could say, hypothetical sources or sources that stand behind uh, the extant uh, works that we do have. So let's start with some non-Christian sources. Okay. Here are our usual suspects. I'm sure you've heard these names before. So there are nine uh, things that come up when someone says, does Jesus exist? Yes, because he's attested to and da 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 And these are the nine. Josephus, Tacitus, Pliny, Suetonius, Mara, Barsepion, Thallus, Lucius, Celsus, and the Sanhedrin, or the Talmud, more accurately. So, what's wrong with this? Um, the name Jesus or Christ shows up in these, but they're not all equally valuable. In fact, it's actually like the first four are the only ones that are even remotely valuable. Um, Thallus is... I don't know. Anytime you see the name Thallus come up in this discussion, it just means that they're not, they're, they're either just mentioning it because they have to, or they haven't actually looked into the sources. The Thallus citation makes no sense. So um, the first four, though, are fairly relevant. That would be Josephus, Tastus, Pliny, and Suetonius. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about Suetonius. Um, not particularly relevant here. So to help order where these sources are, I have here, um, this is Jesus. The, this represents the historical Jesus. And the timeline, you can't really see it, but this dot right here starts at 30, and it goes up to 100. So 100's at the very top, 100 AD, that is. So Jesus probably was around 30-ish CE. We won't really quibble on the dates, okay? So for our non-Christian sources, the first one we have here, um, and I'll actually pivot to some discussion here. So this is a letter from a guy named Pliny the Younger. Um, so he's a random Roman guy. He wrote a letter to the emperor uh, named Trajan, uh, in 112 AD, so this is about 90-ish years, or a little under 90 years after Jesus. Um, and this is what he had to say. They, that is the Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang an anthem to Christ as God, and bound themselves by a solemn oath, not to commit any wicked deeds, but to abstain from all fraud, theft, or adultery, never to break their word, or deny a trust when called upon to honor it. After which it was their custom to separate, and then meet again to partake of food, but food of an ordinary, innocent kind. So, question time. What does this tell us about Jesus? Yeah, go ahead. Don't please raise your hand. Tells, it tells us that people believed in him. Mm -hmm. as, you know, it doesn't really tell us much about uh, who Jesus was or what happened to him, but it tells us more about what people believed about Christ. Yep. That is exactly right. So, the person of Jesus, utterly not useful. Not, doesn't tell us anything about him. Doesn't tell us anything about what happened to him. But it is marginally useful in telling us uh, about a group of early Christians and how they were perceived by the Romans, or at least some of the Romans. Um, the last line where he says a food of an ordinary innocent kind is relevant because there was a hot debate about whether Christians were cannibals for uh, a bit in the early, um, the early church. So. When someone says, Plenty of the Younger proves Jesus. No, Plenty of the Younger proves that there was a group of people saying things about Jesus after that. Okay, so what's the next one? So Tacitus, all right, so it's a little bit better. So this is going to be uh, another Roman historian. And so he's writing about in um, uh, Emperor Nero uh, how, you know, in AD 64, Rome caught on fire and a lot of problems were uh, um, cropping up because of that. And so uh, Tacitus says here, and this is Annals, uh, book 15, chapter 44, Therefore, to squelch the rumor, Nero created scapegoats and subjected the, uh, them to the most refined tortures. 
those whom the common people refer to as Christians, which was a group hated for their abominable crimes. Their name comes from Christus, who during the reign of Tiberius had been executed by the procurator, uh, the procurator Pontius Pilate. Suppress the movement for, wait, suppress for the moment the deadly superstition broke out again, not only in Judea, the land which originated this evil, but also in the very city of Rome. So, next question. Same thing. What does this tell us? Tells us a little bit about the latter two questions. You know, tells us about the fate of someone named Christus, mm -hmm. that he was during the uh, time of Pontius Pilate mm -hmm. executed. And so, you know, that corresponds with Jesus' death. Yeah. And it also tells us a little bit about who the Christians were. They did mo mostly about what other people thought about them, that mm -hmm. people didn't like them all that much, and that it was considered a superstition. Yeah, exactly. So once again, we're trying to probe into the, you know, probe past early Christians to Jesus himself. Um, we get some useful information about how they're superstitious. We don't get any teaching of Jesus or anything like that, but we do get this line, which is, he was executed by Pontius Pilate under the reign of Tiberius, which is actually a a very useful fact. It's trivial, but it's useful um, because now we actually, you know, it's trivial compared to what we do know about Jesus, what else we know about him. But yeah. So, Tacitus, I think, is definitely a pretty solid line of saying that there is a guy who was executed by Pontius Pilate. Okay, so let's look at this last one real quick. Here's the big one. Did you have a comment, Caleb? Oh, no. Oh. Okay, sorry. Okay, so now. The big one in the room, Josephus. This is the one that gets all the attention. Um, so Josephus has two mentions of Jesus, one in, in his uh, massive anthology called The Antiquities of the Jews. Now, the first one is um, one that doesn't get a lot of discussion, uh, but I think it actually should. So this is from Book 20, uh, Chapter 200, where Josephus says, uh, having such a character, uh, Ananus, thought that with Festus dead and Albinus still on the way that he would have the proper opportunity. Convening the judges of the Sanhedrin, he brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ. His name was James, uh, as well as certain others. He accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. Now, uh, this is uh, much later than the really famous passage of Josephus, which we'll talk about in just a second. But this is very useful in the respect that it says, hey, there was a guy named Jesus who was called the Christ, and he had a brother named James. Um, now, if you just take the fact that Tacitus says that there was a guy that was executed by Pontius Pilate under the reign of Tiber Tiberius, and you take this line from Josephus that there was a guy who was alleged to be the Christ who had a brother named James, that's actually quite a bit of information, more than you would expect from most typical people of, of the time period. And frankly, <laughs> I, I don't know if this is just my bias speaking through, but if a guy was killed and had a brother who was like a known human, it's very difficult in my mind to dispute their historicity uh, unless you want to dispute, like unless you have a lot of really countervailing evidence. Um, now, what makes this particular section interesting is that it's really not disputed at all. Like uh, everyone agrees that this phrasing and at least this version of this translation is authentic to Josephus. So if it's an authentic thing, an authentic line from a reliable historian uh, less than 60 years after Jesus I think it's a, I wouldn't call it a silver bullet or a slam dunk, but I would definitely say it's pretty close. At least, it's at least a really strong piece of evidence. Okay, um, so I have it down here. Yeah, somewhat useful. He had a brother. That's really all you get from that particular line. Okay, so let's move on quickly to the next bit uh, deposit here. Am I going to get a thing? Clicker is kill again. Oh, wait, nope. There it goes. Okay. Yeah, all right, this is the one where everyone uh, loses their marbles. So there's a line uh, it, earlier in the Antiquities, uh, chapter 18, or sorry, book 18, uh, line 63 through 64, and I'll just read it as is. At this time there appeared Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one should call him a man, for he was a doer of startling deeds, a teacher of people who received the truth with pleasure, and he gained a following both among many Jews and among uh, men of Greek origin. He was the Messiah, and when Pilate, because of an accusation made by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who had loved him previously did not cease to do so. 
For he appeared to them on the third day, living again, just as the divine prophets had spoken of these and countless other wondrous things about him. And up until this very day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not died out. So, what do we think of this? Is this useful? It's a lot of information. Oh, yeah. yeah that's pretty much anything. <laughs> wow, yeah. That's like the gospel of uh, Mark right there. So, yeah, Sam says it's useful. Too useful. It's true. Yeah, so the biggest thing, and I, I have it in brackets here. Remember, Josephus is a, a, a Jewish man um, writing an Antiquities of the Jews. Uh, and he, uh, according to Origen, never converted to Christianity um, and held kind of a bit of a resentful attitude towards the Christians. Um, and previously, what we just talked about was uh, Jesus' brother and followers being stoned appropriately in Josephus' eyes for uh, laws that they had broken. So why would a guy with this background say things like, Jesus was the Messiah? Highly, highly suspect. So, there has been great debate about this passage. Um, the, and the, if you're a person who wants to argue against the historicity of Jesus, the easiest thing to do is just say, oh, well, the whole thing was interpolated by a Christian. Um, and there are at least a handful of scholars who independently think that, that they think this whole thing was completely interpolated. But the overwhelming majority don't think that it was completely made up. So, um, I'll walk you through a couple of... Uh, uh, reconstructions of this. So uh, John Meyer is the guy that uh, I'm quoting for this translation. He has a pretty straightforward approach, which is take a scalpel and excise these parts that are suspicious and just take them out. And so now you have, there was a guy named Jesus, a doer of startling deeds. He gained a following. Pilate uh, condemned him to the cross. And until this day, the tribe of Christians has not died out. Fairly neutral statement. Um, and this particular approach actually has quite a few adherents that, thinks that, that think that this is pretty much what Josephus wrote uh, and that these in interpolations were just that, a Christian making parenthetical uh, remarks later after copying, uh, op copying a copy of the Antiquities. There's another uh, reconstruction which um, is a little less neutral, and that would be by F.F. F. Bruce. He calls this the negative, or I'm going to call this the negative Josephus. And um, Bruce's reconstruction says, there arose at this time a source of further trouble in one Jesus, a wise man who performed surprising works, a teacher of men who gladly welcomed strange things. Uh, he led away many Jews as well as many Gentiles. He was the so-called Christ. When Pilate, acting on information supplied by the chief men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who attached themselves to him at the first did not cease to cause trouble, and the tribe of Christians which has taken its name is still not extinct, even today. This is a proposed reconstruction. Um, this one has a couple of adherents, um, but you can see it's much more aggressive um, uh, when compared to the mere re uh, excision uh, reconstruction. On the flip side, uh, there's another guy whose name is uh, Shlomo Pines, and he actually works with a translation of Josephus. So Josephus' uh, Antiquities was received by um, uh, the, the, sorry, the uh, scribes that made copies of uh, Josephus' Antiquities were predominantly, um, yes, I said Shlomo Pines, yes. Uh, the copies of Josephus that we have are predominantly from medieval Christians. So what's interesting is that there was uh, a group of um, Islamic scholars in, in the Arabic world that preserved a translation of the Antiquities uh, through, um, that didn't go through Christian hands. And so this is a translation that uh, was ultimately into Arabic, and then Shlomo Pines, this guy, uh, reconstructed it and translated it back into English. And it's a little bit more positive. It says, at this time there was a man called Jesus. His conduct was good. He was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified, and he died. And those who uh, had become his disciples did not abandon discipleship. They reported uh, that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was thought to be the Messiah. Concerning uh, whom the prophets have related wonders, and the people of Christians named after him has not disappeared until this day. It's a little, a little bit more positive. So what do we do with uh, 
these uh, particular uh, reconstructions. Come on, man. Why is the break not? There we go. Okay. So here's 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 my assessment here. Okay. So first, pretty much all scholars agree that um, if you take the Meyer reconstruction, which is neutral, the Bruce reconstruction, which is negative, or the Pines reconstruction, which is more positive, um, whichever one you take, Jesus had a reputation as a wise man and a teacher. Okay, so he was a rabbi, pretty much. He was a man known uh, with a reputation for performing unusual works. This also, a lot of other people uh, in, the, in Palestine in the first century doing this. Uh, he had a significant following that led the Jewish leadership to be uh, mad and respond against him. He was, again, crucified in Judea under Pontius Pilate. Uh, and the movement that Jesus started was still going on at the end of the first century because Josephus was writing in about 90 AD or so. Um, and interestingly, if you take the Bruce construction or the Pine construction, uh, they take the reference to the uh, claiming to be the Messiah to be authentic. Um, Meyer doesn't agree with that, so uh, that's a more contested issue. Um, but if you're persuaded that either Bruce or Pines has the right uh, reconstruction, you can also add that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, or that at least his followers cl um, claimed that he was the disciple. So we get like soaring marks here, somewhat useful on everything. Hooray. Okay, so let's throw it up on the board. So we have Jesus down here at 30-ish AD, and then we've got Pliny the Younger up here in the hundreds, Tacitus up here in the hundreds, and Josephus here in the 90s, all right? So can we get any further uh, closer to Jesus um, besides just these three guys? Um, okay, well, before we do that, um, quick summary. Uh, the summary here is actually identical to what I just said, so... Um, Hey, do you have some more uh, batteries that I can just... Does it show the batteries as well as the uh, No, actually it doesn't. It just says the yeah, signal is okay. jacked up. That's weird. Now it's completely gone. Oh, no. Well, in any event, the, the basic summary is just, look, there was a guy named Jesus running around saying crazy things about himself, saying crazy things about God, got himself into trouble, got executed by Pontius Pilate. Is anybody surprised at this or like this is just shocking information? Yeah. But um, I think the most relevant point is this line right here, which is that the best use of these sources for all of them and is that they're useful when you're talking about the origin of Christianity and you're talking about the movement that continued after Jesus' death. They're not going to tell you anything directly about Jesus that is not attested to in an earlier or better source. Um, now, my own personal opinion is I think that you can demonstrate that Jesus existed with reasonable historical certainty, just on the non-Christian evidence. Uh, some people disagree with that. Um, I think there's enough that if, if, if a neutral party were to just read this, they would probably conclude that Jesus existed. So, now for the more controversial thing. Let's talk about what exists in the uh, Christian literature, a.k.a. the New Testament. So I think the first thing, and this is the most important thing, is the New Testament is not a book. It is not a source. Um, it is not a single uh, point of reference. Rather, it is a collection of multiple final works um, as well as, did it break? Oh no, I just didn't push it right. Um, it's a collection of multiple final works as well as the sources that are preserved in those works. So a really quick overview, there are 27 books that are accepted across uh, the Christian New Testament canon. You have four Gospels plus uh, the book of Acts. You have uh, 13 letters of Paul, of which there are seven that, uh, or of which there are six that people argue about whether Paul actually wrote them or not. And then you've got a handful of random other letters, uh, 1 John, James, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, all right. Um, so I think the, the main point here is just that when people say things like, oh, the Bible says this or the Bible says that, it's so frustrating because the Bible is not a work. It is a collection of multiple works with multiple authors, um, possibly with multiple agendas, depending on where, where you fall on that line. So um, I think that's the first point. Now, the second point is that, interestingly, the sources, um, what is at least traditionally uh, thought, is that you have the Gospels, which are your best source, and then everything else is supplementary to that. But that's actually not the case. So the Gospels, we'll start there because that's what most people um, think about when they talk about Jesus. Um, 
Firstly, as far as genre goes, uh, that's probably the biggest debate whenever you have people that are um, espousing like mythicism or disputing the existence of Jesus or something like that. It usually hinges on what is the genre of the gospel. Because if the gospel is some type of like mythic work or something like that, then the characters are probably going to be mythic in nature. Um, however, most scholarship is kind of agreed um, that the genre is more or less ancient biography. They're written in Greek. A lot of Greek lives were written uh, during that time period. Um, and it's mostly influenced by this guy named uh, Burridge, Richard Burridge, I think is his full name, where he, uh, he made this really extensive argument uh, in his book in 2004. I don't have the title, unfortunately. Uh, that really convinced like all of New Testament, um, for the most part, most of New Testament scholarship, that what we're dealing with is more or less ancient biographies. Um, obviously dressed up with a lot of miraculous stories. Um, you know, you have a, a, a virgin birth narrative, for example, you know, like pretty much like a lot of your other lives of Caesars and things like that. Like, but that's the, more or less the genre that you're dealing with. Um, and so because of that, many people, many scholars even would say, yeah, these are your best sources for Jesus. Um, but they weren't actually written super duper early. They were written pretty early, uh, comparatively speaking. Let's put them up on the map here. Uh, depending on how you date them, um, and there are a lot of different ways you can do this, the more, um, I guess, safe numbers that I have up here, n you won't get in trouble if you put these numbers up. You'll get in trouble if you put early numbers. You'll get in trouble if you put late numbers, but these are the safe numbers. Uh, about 70 A.D. for Mark and about 90 A.D. for John. And then uh, Matthew, Luke, and Acts are fall kind of in the middle there in the, in the 80s. Um, so you have uh, about a 60-year uh, gap um, for John and about a, I don't know, 40-year gap for Mark, which is actually by ancient standards not horrible. Um, but we can always do better. So... That's actually where we want to talk about with the letters of Paul. So like I said, there are uh, 13 of these letters. Uh, there are seven that are undisputed. Nobody throws a fit if you say Paul wrote them. There are three letters that are questioned. People go back and forth over that. That's Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians. Then there are three uh, letters that if you say Paul wrote them, uh, you're in for a very, very hot debate. Uh, that would be 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. Luckily, nobody actually cares about 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, so... If you, if you uh, accept whenever you talk about that line in 2 Timothy about women speaking and all that, whew, if you really want to ruffle feathers, say, Paul taught in 2 Timothy women shouldn't preach in church. That was guaranteed to make everybody mad um, just across the board. So, factoid there. But these are actually particularly useful because Paul, um, who converted to Christianity, well, did he convert? Ah, that's another, that's another debate. Uh, he claimed to be an eyewitness of the risen Christ in the neighborhood of 35 or so A.D., and then started writing these letters um, between about 50 A.D. until he died in 67 uh, A.D. So he, uh, Paul, the point of that being that Paul's latest letter is earlier than the consensus date for the earliest gospel, which is Mark. Mark is widely believed to be written first at about 70 A.D. So his latest work is earlier than the earliest Gospels. And for that reason, it's highly valuable uh, historically. So let's throw that up there on the map. You can kind of get an idea of where, where this is going right here. Um, for the purposes of authorship, I've just lumped in uh, Timothy and Titus into the Pauline epistles. It doesn't make a difference for what we're talking about. So let's talk about the next bit here. Um, Seems to have broken again. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, then you've got your other epistles. They're not particularly relevant for what we're talking about. They're relevant from a biblical point of view if you want to learn about early Christianity, but as far as Jesus is concerned, um, his historicity is not all that um, relevant. So that's your entire New Testament. A bunch of letters of Paul, scattered let letters here, your four Gospels and Acts over here, non-Christian guys there. Nothing I've said is controversial, I don't think. This may even be tedious since it's so non-controversial. Okay, I'll try to uh, turn up some controversy here. All righty, so now the last bit is where did the authors of the New Testament, well, let me be very precise. Where did the authors of the works that were lated, later collected into the New Testament, where did they get their sources? So um, first, that's 
By the way, that's anti-New Testament, not anti, like against New Testament. So um, there's a very interesting line at the very opening of the Gospel of Luke, um, which I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but the book of Luke and the book of Acts are actually the same. Uh, they're written by the same author at about the same time period. Why is this going the wrong direction? There we go. Okay. Um, so the, the opening to the book of Luke is uh, from the author. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided after investigating everything carefully from the first to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning these things about which you have been instructed. For this reason, Luke is like everybody's favorite gospel because it's very clear, it's very orderly, he cites his sources. Mark, on the other hand, is pretty chaotic by comparison. Um, it's often been said that most historical Jesus studies just are a reconstruction of Luke. Like you go through all this rigmarole and at the end of the day, you've just written a worse version of the book of Luke. So should have just gone back to it. But the point that's relevant here is that the author of Luke um, is saying other people have tried to write down a story of Jesus. I have talked to those people. I've read their works. I have talked to uh, people that were related to the incident, and I've brought together my own book uh, for you, Theophilus, who's the, the, the subject. Um, so the first intro to this is to talk about the Gospels, and the first line item there is what's called the synoptic problem. Um, so is anybody familiar with the synoptic problem? I mean, this is the synoptic problem. So just digest that for a second. Right. So if you take the four, if you take the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you line them up sideways and kind of read them uh, one after the other, sort of read them in parallel, you find out that a lot of the same stories crop up um, between the three of them. And not just the same stories that show up, but the same wording and the same adjectives and the same phraseology pop up between them. To the point where uh, 76% of the stuff that shows up in Mark shows up in Luke and Matthew virtually identically. Now, you can quibble about how identical it is, but for all intents, for all intensive purposes, uh, for all intents and purposes, it's the same. So you have uh, the triple tradition is a collection of verses in Greek that you can find in Mark and in Luke and in Matthew. Now there's another collection of verses called the double tradition which also shows up almost exactly the same, but just in Luke and just in Matthew. Now, perhaps the most, uh, perhaps the best example of this would be the Beatitudes. You find all the Beatitudes exactly same, more or less the same wording in Matthew and in Luke. None of it is found in Mark. Then you have um, a little bit of material that shows up in Mark and Matthew, but not in Luke, and then you have like like a rounding error of material that shows up in Mark and Luke, but not in Matthew. Um, and then what's important here is you'll notice that the stuff that's unique to Mark is just a tiny little sliver. So in other words, about 95% of the entire book of Mark is reproduced between Luke and Matthew. So, um, and then of course, about a third of Luke is unique to Luke and about a fifth of Matthew is unique to Matthew. So the question is, why is this the case? Why are these uh, three books showing up with a lot of apparent overlap? So there are a couple of answers to this, and if you want the full answer to this, we have a podcast episode on think theism uh, called The Synoptic Problem, which is what this is, and uh, we kind of walk through some of the alternative explanations. Um, but the first answer is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written by independent eyewitnesses, but since they were witnesses to the same events, they just wrote things the same way. Thoughts? People tend to have very different ways of seeing things and thinking about things, so it seems kind of rare that they would write it down in the exact same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The thing that, um, and again, if you listen to our podcast episode, plug, plug, um, I'll talk about that graph in a minute, but let me just get to the I'm pointing there. There we go. Search, search, find this. 
Um, but one of the comments that I, that I make in there that I, I find persuasive myself is the reason, uh, because on, on the face of it, if you ever read New Testament studies, almost any, any textbook or introductory book or really anything about the synoptic problem presupposes that there is what's called literary dependence between them. In other words, there's some type of copying either of a previous source or of each other. But almost nobody tries to demonstrate that there is literary dependence. It's just assumed. And it's just, if you look at it, then you can tell. Um, like, you know, if you submit the three Gospels on turn it in or something, it'll trip the, it'll trip the sensor or something. I don't, I don't know exactly what that is. But it, it's so frustrating to, for me because almost nobody gives an argument for it. But the argument that I do find persuasive, at least to me, is if you have quotes of Jesus or common aphorisms of Jesus that are the same throughout the Gospels, that's not that surprising. But when you have narratival accounts that are using the same adjectives in the same place um, and using the same sentence structure, then it starts to get suspicious. Because you can have two people see a same event and interpret it radically, not, well, they can interpret it differently, but they will relay it with radically different vocabularies. This is definitely the case with myself and Ada whenever we talk about, you know, whenever we try to share stories about things that happen to us. Um, for example, I mean, for the plain and simple reason, Ada sometimes uses Spanish nouns, and I don't know any Spanish nouns. Well, none that are not food related, but in, in any event, if she tells a story and I tell a story about an event that we shared, we're not going to tell it the same way. So whenever you have this much material popping up like that in narratival accounts, I think it's highly suspicious. So one solution to this problem, and again, there are literally, I'm not exaggerating, 22 independent solutions to this problem. But the most common and popular one is called the Q source theory, which is this right here, which says the reason that, Matthew, that Mark shows up in Matthew and Luke as much as it does is simply because it was written first and Matthew and Luke copied from Mark. And pr pretty straightforward, right? Then the second question is, well, what about this double tradition of stuff that shows up? Whoop, wrong direction again. Here we go. What about this double tradition that shows up between Matthew and Luke? Well, that's where things get a little more speculative. But um, what if it's just the same thing? They both copy from Mark, and then they both copy from another book or another source, which is a hypothetical source called Q. So that's what that Q is coming from. Now, does Q exist? No one's really seen it. Some people don't think it exists because they have an alternative theory to the Snoppy problem. Um, at least me personally, I find it more persuasive than the, uh, than the alternatives. Um, so I think that, <laughs> I think that Q probably, probably exists. Sam says that he has uh, eyewitness evidence of Q. So I'm interested to see that published. I think he's referring to a few episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Yeah, Maybe. probably. Yeah. So that's where we get our first delve into these hypothetical sources. So the, the point here being that this hypothetical source just wasn't dreamt up out of nowhere. You have a phenomenon, uh, and you explain it by postulating entities. Q is a postulated entity. So now the question is, what other things, what other possible sources could be standing behind the text? Um, and so this is just what I uh, represented right there. You have Q that shows up in Matthew and Luke. Um, and then what if the unique material also just comes from another source? Let's just call it L for special Lucan material and M for special Matthewan material. Nice, neat, clean, four sources, four books. Pretty straightforward. So the real question is, what does Q actually have in it? Um, and again, since it's hypothetical, a lot of people are, have freedom to sort of speculate about what's in it. But for the most part, most scholars agree that it's probably a saying source, since most of the double tradition that shows up in Matthew and Luke uh, are just that, they're saying. So it's the collected sayings of Jesus, which is highly useful if you want to find out what Jesus is about. Here's a collection of his teachings. Not particularly useful uh, to what happened to him, and not particularly useful about practices or beliefs of early Christians. So interesting, useful in some respects, but not useful in other respects. Um, oh, right, okay. One other uh, quite, uh, debate is if Mark himself had any sources, or the, the author of the Gospel of Mark, if he had sources. That whole system that we discussed presupposes Mark as a kind of a standalone book. Um, but many scholars postulate that there's what's called a pre-Mark and Passion narrative. And the reason for that is because if you read the book of Mark, 
uh, it's pretty chaotic. There's a lot of and this, and that, and then, and they, and then, and that, and immediately, et cetera, et cetera. And then whenever you hit Mark chapter 15, or sorry, Mark chapter 14, you enter uh, where Jesus goes to, um, or you enter Jesus' passion, where he goes on trial and all that kind of stuff. And the narrative really slows down, uh, both temporally, because it's just a couple of days it's covered, but also uh, linguistically. Like, it's a very slow, methodical, smooth story that doesn't read like a bunch of and then, and then, and then, and immediately, and then, and then, and then. So because of that, some people speculate that Mark had a source called a passion narrative um, that he then filled in the backstory about what happened to Jesus leading up to the passion narrative. Now, uh, this is highly contentious, and it's one of those issues where a lot of people agree it exists, but almost nobody agrees what it actually says. So uh, Marion Swords surveyed something like 35 uh, professional articles and found there were only eight verses in this 90-verse passage that even have like a 70% consensus on being uh, original uh, to the passion narrative. Um, so when only like, you know, 8% of your, uh, uh, when you can only have about 8% of your material agreed upon in any reasonable metric, it's, it's really just best to say at that point, nobody really knows. So for the most part, it is largely indeterminate what the distinction is between the Gospel of Mark and what the uh, pre-Mark um, material is. So because of this, some people just say pre-Mark is Mark. It was written in 70 AD. Um, others don't. So that is another hypothetical source that is brought up. <coughs> I think I have a broken thing again. Here we go. Um, this is the particular burial narrative that's on there. Okay. Uh, let's see here. How are we doing on time? It's 8.30. Okay, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, the last uh, couple of items here, uh, if you read the book of Acts, it's overwhelmingly dominated by speeches given by the uh, apostles. So in particular, Acts chapter 18, um, or actually, you don't even have to go that far. Acts chapter 2 uh, has... Uh, Peter, standing up with the eleven, whenever asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he says, he gives this really long oration about uh, this man, Jesus, whom you crucified, uh, God has raised up, um, and uh, he carries on for like half a chapter. And then the response of the people is, well, what are we going to do about that? And then uh, Peter says, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, every one of you. Uh, for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises unto you and your children, as many that are far off, etc., etc. And he gives like this really long oration outlining what Jesus was about, what happened to him, what you need to do about it. Um, turns out 22% of Acts consists of just these principal speeches. And if you take the minor speeches, it's like half of Acts is, is what this is about. Now, there's a really interesting historical side note we can go on about ancient uh, biographies and whether they contain speeches and things of that nature. But in general, most people agree that, e that the wording, the exact wording of the speeches is not going to be exactly what came from Peter's mouth. In particular, the whole thing is written in Greek. Uh, Peter was probably not preaching in Greek to uh, Jews in Palestine in the first century. Highly unlikely. But what is agreed by scholars is that it contains the impissima vox, or the general gist of kind of like what they were saying. Um, there's a lot we could say about like speeches and how other historians dealt with speeches of Caesars and things like that. But in general, this is highly useful for figuring out what the apostles actually said, especially since many of them didn't really write down, um, uh, they didn't leave anything in writing. So I think the speeches and acts count more or less as a, uh, an independent and quite useful source um, for probing both early Christianity and uh, the historical Jesus. This is cause for problems. Okay, now the last thing that I want to spend quite a bit of time on is probably the biggest uh, source of uh, consternation about uh, pre-existent material, which is this creed, which here I'll skip to the next one because it's a different color. Um, in the letter to the Corinthians, uh, Paul talks a lot about the terrible things that they're doing and whatnot, and whatnot, and talks about how you need to uh, shape up and stop having sex with your stepmom and 
cover your hair and a bunch of other weird stuff that nobody likes to talk about. But then he g talks about the resurrection in chapter 15, which is guaranteed in two days to be preached across many millions of pulpits in America and the greater Western world because uh, it's like the text about the resurrection. Um, so benefits of this letter is that first, very early letter, one of Paul's first letters. Secondly, authentic, like undisputed, nobody throws a fit. If you say 1 Corinthians was written by Paul, 100% agree with that. And then thirdly, the creed that he cites here is ex like super early. So I'll just read it for you. A um, little bit of context, he's talking to the Corinthians and then he says, I need to remind you of the gospel which I first preached to you and then says, for I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Kephas, uh, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brethren all at one time, Mo parenthetical comment here, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then he appeared to all the apostles. Then a personal comment, last of all, as to one untimely board, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God who was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. So this is enormously valuable. Like if you, uh, let me find the book here. So this book right here is called Assessing the New Testament Evidence uh, for the Resurrection. And... Let me avert a disaster. There we go. Disaster averted. Uh, and literally, the first chapter in this book is 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 3 and following. And it takes up 51 pages of this book that's like 200 pages long. So in a book that ostensibly uh, is talking about all the New Testament evidence for the resurrection and historicity of Jesus that spends like a good, you know, third of it on just this passage. It's enormously important. Um, so part of why, um, sorry, there's a question in the chat. The authorship question is more fundamental. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question, but in this case, the authorship is not in question because uh, Paul is... Uh, certainly the author of this, but what is important is that he didn't li he didn't like write it himself. He actually got it from uh, other apostles, which are uh, whenever you process this with Galatians, most people think that it was from his meeting with uh, Peter and James um, early uh, early after his conversion. So how early is this is the real question. And most scholars date this to like definitely within ten years of Jesus's death, probably within five years. If you want to be really aggressive, you you can find some people that say it was like six months. I don't know how on earth you can date anything in ancient history to the precision of plus or minus a month, but <laughs> I find that suspicious. But in any event, it is. Like, if you want to talk about the earliest preaching of the Gospels and the earliest attestation to Jesus or anything, this would be uh, what you're looking for. So where is the value here? So if you take all of these things that we've talked about from the New Testament, you take this creed that we just mentioned from 1 Corinthians 15, you take uh, the speeches of Acts, and you take the narrative of, like, say, Mark, for example, and you line them up, you can get an outline of the life of Jesus, or rather the, the, the ending of his life. So 1 Corinthians 15 says Christ died, he was buried, he was raised, and he appeared. Acts 13, same thing. Though they could charge him with nothing deserving death, they asked Pilate to have him killed. They took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who came up from him, came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And then Mark 15 gives, of course, the narrative. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Uh, Joseph brought, of Arimathea, that is, brought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and uh, put him in a tomb. Uh, the women announce he is risen. He is not here. See the, oh, sorry. The women discover the angel who then tells him, tells them, he has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. Um, I mean, side note there, there are no uh, resurrection appearances in Mark, but it's sort of uh, anticipated in, in this line right here. So, pretty helpful, I think. Where is, oh, the clicker's dead again. There we go. So here's kind of a zoomed-in version of the chart I was showing that shows you sort of the most uh, hotly 
uh, discussed, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I guess hypothetical sources to where the Gospels and Paul and all of them came from. Now, there are many more that we could add in here. For example, in the letter to Romans, you have some oral formula that are similar to that creed. Uh, you have some in Luke, even, that sort of show up. But as far as the discussion of the historicity and resurrection of Jesus, these are the ones that get uh, the most attention. <clears throat> so we now return, in conclusion, to our final question. Did Jesus exist? And the answer is yes. He's abundantly attested in early sources. So we talked about a handful of non-Christian sources that attest to him. We talked about a bunch of Christian sources that talk about him. And then we talked about the uh, hypothetical sources and how early they uh, may or may not have been. Um, and they're useful for the three questions. Who was Jesus? That would be things like the Gospels. Um, the speeches and acts are helpful for that. What happened to Jesus? Um, that's actually useful for, or the fate of Jesus, rather. That's You can find sources on that. Um, across the board, really. The one thing that's like historically undisputed about Jesus is he was killed by crucifixion uh, under the reign of Pontius Pilate. If there's nothing else we know about him, it's definitely that. And then lastly, what was early Christianity about? This is, um, you know, a PhD thesis all on its own. Uh, N.T. Wright, in particular, has tried to answer this question about early Christianity, um, and it's taken him... What is 600 times five? Is that 3,000? Can I do that math right? Yeah, so 3,000 pages for him to get just from early Christianity through Jesus through Paul. So he's at, what, 60 AD? Um, and it's at like 3,000 pages. So he's, he's writing a massive series on this. Um, and pretty much you can find a lot of different uh, New Testament scholars that have done this. Uh, J.P. Meyer. Uh, has a series called A Marginal Jew. Uh, he tells the same story. It was originally supposed to be a single book. It's now, well, it's like four volumes spanning 15 years of writing. It's a huge question. So um, we're not going to focus too much on those questions just because they are so big. But we can talk a little bit about the fate of Jesus. So the first thing um, that I think I mentioned was, sorry, I'm waiting on the clicker here to do its, do its thing. There it goes. So first, like I said, Jesus was crucified under the reign of Pontius Pilate. Undisputed. Nobody's going to throw a fit uh, if you say that. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Now, controversy. Joseph of Arimathea probably buried Jesus in a tomb, and the tomb was likely found empty by a group of uh, his women followers following the first day of the week following the crucifixion. That will get you in a lot of trouble, but I think that that is a reasonably historical fact that we know a little bit about what happened to him after that. Uh, thirdly, sorry, this thing is really messing up. Can you just do it for me? Oh, okay. Thirdly, we have a lot of individuals and groups, in particular Simon by name, James by name, Paul by name, uh, I think, yeah, that uh, individually experience the risen Jesus. Several groups, we have the disciples, the 12, well, we have the 12, the apostles, all of the disciples um, eventually, uh, and then, of course, the, re the reference to the 500. Of course, who knows what that's about. Um, so they saw Jesus alive, uh, or claimed to have seen Jesus alive after that. And then, fourthly, this tells you a little bit about the beliefs of early Christianity. They've, these uh, followers and disciples very seriously believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Um, so next week, the question that we'll discuss is, did the actual resurrection occur? Like, or is that actually a good explanation of this general summary of uh, how Jesus met his fate? 